Book five. Ethan Dune, the first stroke. King Guthrum was a dread king, like death out of the north. Shrines without name or number he rent and rolled as lumber. From Chester to the Humber he drove his foemen forth. The Roman villas heard him in the valley of the Thames, come over the hills roaring above their roofs and pouring on spire and stair and flooring brimstone and pitch and flames. Sheer o'er the great chalk uplands, and the hill of the horse went he, till high on Hampshire beacons he saw the southern sea. High on the heights of Wessex he saw the southern brine and turned him to a conquered land. And where the northern thorn woods stand and the road parts on either hand, there came to him a sign. King Guthrum was a war chief, a wise man in the field, and though he prospered well and knew how Alfred's folk were sad and few, not less with weighty care he drew long lines for pike and shield. King Guthrum lay on the upper land, on a single road at gaze, and his foe must come with lean array up the left arm of the cloven way to the meeting of the ways. And long ere the noise of armor, an hour ere the break of light, the woods awoke with crash and cry, and the birds sprang clamoring harsh and high, and the rabbits ran like an elves' army ere Alfred came in sight. The live wood came at Guthrum on foot and claw and wing, the nests were noisy overhead, for Alfred and the star of red, all life went forth, and the forest fled before the face of the king. But halted in the woodways, Christ's few were grim and gray, and each with a small, far bird-like sight saw the high folly of the fight. And though strange joys had grown in the night, despair grew with the day. And when white dawn crawled through the wood like cold foam of a flood, then weakened every warrior's mood in hope, though not in hardihood, and each man sorrowed as he stood, in the fashion of his blood. For the Franklin, for the Saxon Franklin sorrowed for the things that had been fair, for the dear dead women, crimson-clad, and the great feasts and the friends he had. But the Celtic prince's soul was sad for things that never were. In the eyes Italian all things but a black laughter died. And Alfred flung his shield to earth and smote his breast and cried, I have wronged a man to his slaying and a woman to her shame. And once I looked on a sworn maid that was wed to the holy name. And once I took my neighbor's wife that was bound to an Eastland man in the darkness of my evil youth before my griefs began. People, if you have any prayers, say prayers for me. And lay me under a Christian stone in that lost land I thought my own to wait till the holy horn is blown and all poor men are free. Then Eldred of the idle farm leaned on his ancient sword as fell his heavy words and few and his eyes were of such alien blue as gleams where the northman saileth new into an unknown fjord i was a fool and wasted ale my slaves found it sweet i was a fool and wasted bread and the birds had bread to eat the kings go up and the kings go down and who knows who shall rule next night a king may starve or sleep but men and birds and beasts shall weep at the burial of a fool Oh, drunkards in my cellar, boys in my apple tree, the world goes stern and strange and new, and wise men shall govern you, and you shall weep for me. But yoke me my own oxen down to my own farm. My own dog will whine for me, my own friends will bend the knee, and the foes I slew openly have never wished me harm. And all were moved a little, but Colin stood apart, having first pity, and after hearing, like rat in rafter, that little worm of laughter that eats the Irish heart, and his gray-green eyes were cruel, and the smile of his mouth waxed hard. And he said, And when did Britain become your burying yard? Before the Romans lit the land, when schools and monks were none, we reared such stones to the sun god as might put out the sun. The tall trees of Britain we worshipped and were wise, but you shall ray the whole land through, and never a tree shall talk to you, though every leaf is a tongue chopped true, and the forest is full of eyes. On one round hill to the seaward, 
The trees grow tall and gray, and the trees talk together when all men are away. O'er a few round hills forgotten, the trees grow tall in rings, and the trees talk together of many pagan things. Yet I could lie and listen with a cross upon my clay and hear unhurt forever what the trees of Britain say. Proud man was the Roman, his speech a single one, but his eyes were like an eagle's eyes that is staring at the sun. Dig for me where I die, said he, if first or last I fall. Dead on the fell at the first charge, or dead by wanted wall, lift not my head from bloody ground, bear not my body home, for all the earth is Roman earth, and I will die in Rome. Then Alfred, king of England, bade blow the horns of war and fling the golden dragon out with crackle and acclaim and shout, scrolled and aflame and far, and under the golden dragon went Wessex all along, past the sharp point of the cloven ways, out from the black wood into the blaze of sun and steel and song. And when they came to the open land, they wheeled, deployed, and stood. Midmost were Marcus and the king, and Eldred on the right-hand wing, and leftwards, colon, darkling in the last shade of the wood. But the earls of the great army lay like a long half-moon, ten poles before their palisades with wide-winged helms and runic blades, red giants of an age of raids in the thorn land of Ethan Dune. Midmost, the saddles rose and swayed, and a stir of horses' manes where Guthrum and a few rode high on horses seized in victory. But Ogier went on foot to die in the old way of the Danes. Far to the king's right, Elf the Bard lit on the western wing with songs and spells that changed the blood, and on the king's left, Harold stood, the kinsman of the king. Young Harold, coarse, with colors gay, smoking with oil and musk, and the pleasant violence of the young, pushed through his people, giving tongue forwards, where gray as cobwebs hung the banners of the usk. But as he came before his line, a little space along, his beardless face broke into mirth. And he cried, What broken bits of earth are here? For what their clothes are worth, I would sell them for a song. For Colin was hung with raiment tattered as autumn leaves. And his men were all as thin as saints, and all as poor as thieves. No bows, nor slings, nor bolts they bore, but bills and pikes ill made, and none but Colin bore a sword, and rusty was its blade. And Colin's eyes with mystery and iron laughter stirred. And he spoke aloud, but lightly, not laboring to be heard. O oh, truly, we be broken hearts. For that cause, it is said, we light our candles to the Lord that broke himself for bread. But though we hold but bitterly what land the Saxon leaves, though Ireland be but a land of saints, and Wales a land of thieves, I say, you yet shall weary of the working of your word that stricken spirits never strike, nor lean hands hold a sword. And if ever ye ride in Ireland, the jest may yet be said, there is the land of broken hearts and the land of broken heads. Not less barbarian laughter choked Harold like a flood. And shall I fight with scarecrows that am of Guthrum's blood? Meeting may be of war men, where the best war man wins, but all this carrying a man shoots before the fight begins, and stopping in his onward strides, he snatched a bone in scorn from some mean slave, and bent it on Colin, whose doom grew dark and shone stars evil over Caleron, in the place where he was born. For Colin had not bow nor sling, on a lonely sword leaned he, like Arthur on Excalibur in the battle by the sea, to the great gold earring herald tugged back the feathered tail, and swift had sprung the arrow, but swifter sprang the gale. Whirling the one sword round his head, a great wheel in the sun, he sent it splendid through the sky, flying before the shaft could fly. It smote Earl Harold over the eye, and blood began to run. Colin stood bare and weaponless. Earl Harold, as in pain, strove for a smile, put hand to head, stumbled, and suddenly fell dead and the small white daisies all waxed red with blood out of his brain. And all at the marvel of the sword, cast like a stone to slay, cried out. Said Alfred, Who would see signs must give all things? Verily man shall not taste of victory till he throws his sword away. 
Then Alfred, Prince of England, and all the Christian earls unhooked their swords and held them up, each awful to colon, like a cup of chrysolite and pearls. And the king said, Do thou take my sword, who have done this deed of fire. For this is the manner of Christian men, whether of steel or a priestly pin, that they cast their heart out of their kin to get their heart's desire. And whether ye swear a hive of monks or one fair wife to friend, this is the manner of Christian men, that their oath endures the end. For love, our Lord, at the end of the world, sits a red horse like a throne, with a brazen helm and an iron bow, but one arrow alone. Love with the shield of the broken heart ever his bow doth bend, with a single shaft for a single prize, and the ultimate bolt that parts and flies comes with a thunder of split skies and a sound of souls that rend, so shall you earn a king's sword who cast your sword away. And the king took with a random eye a rude axe from a hind hard by and turned him to the fray, for the swords of the earls of Daneland flamed round their fallen lord. The first blood woke the trumpet tune as in monk's rhyme or wizard's rune, beginneth the battle of Ethandun with the throwing of the sword.